And I say, come over, come over, come on over, you'll see. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Town of Portland and slash uh, Portland School District podcast. This is episode number 27. And uh, in this uh, pandemic area that we're living in, uh, we are uh, very thankful to have on our line right now our uh, director of, of health from the Chatham Health District, Mr. Russ Melman. So uh, welcome, Russ. I assume that you're keeping yourself very busy these days. Uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're busy with, uh, with cases ticking up in the district, um, you know, it's starting to touch a lot, of, a lot of people in a lot of different places. So, you know, we're getting calls from businesses across the spectrum of sectors, you know, from uh, restaurants to entertainment venues, uh, from people who had, you know, small social gatherings at home to people who, uh, you know, work in the schools. I mean, it's sort of, it's starting to touch, uh, I think, everybody. At this point, I'd be surprised if there's anybody out there who's listening to this podcast today who doesn't know somebody who's either had COVID-19 or has been told to quarantine because they've had close contact. So I think it's, we're, we're kind of at that point. I, I, I realize that, you know, I think uh, we had our first case in the, uh, the, the town hall and uh, we had a, uh, a company come in, do a deep clean disinfection and so forth. And we've got people quarantining. Uh, but we're, you know, we're still open and again, again, under our Corvette precautions, uh, as far as that goes, you know, signing in very limited access hey, not, Dave, you in? and to go from there. Okay. And, uh, oh, here we go. Uh, Charles is just here with us, uh, uh, Russ. So, uh, just walking in, uh, hello, Charles. How hey, are you? Dave, how are you? I'm doing well. I have, uh, Mr. Russ Melmet on the line. So, oh, that's my, I, I'm in. Russ is my new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, excellent. So, uh, yeah, Russ. So, um, so I, I know uh, everybody is uh, kind of take precautions. So, uh, you know, continue on, and we'll have Charles jump in here, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, I'm glad Russ is here too. He can uh, help elaborate on what I what I have to share. Sure. Uh, you're getting pretty good, Charles. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm, I'll need to chime in here. <laughs> Lots of experience at this point. Yeah, unfortunately. unfortunately. So anyway, Russ, so, uh, you, know, where, you know, where's the Chatham Health District? I know for the most part, we are, are we still in the orange area? Uh, yes. Uh, um, well, Portland, uh, I mean, here's, I'll just run down the list. Um, and that, this list is going to get updated today at around 4 o'clock. So, so stay tuned, I suppose. For those of you listening, it's about 11.30 on, on Thursday the 12th. Um, so we've got a few hours before we update those numbers. Mm-hmm. Um, but Colchester is in the orange alert level, Marlboro is in the orange alert level, Portland in the orange alert level, East Hampton in the red alert level, East Haddam, which up until very recently had really not had a, any really significant issue with COVID-19, just sort of very sporadic cases in, in a, one family or two families. They're on the yellow alert level. Hebron right now is the only one that is not on the alert level system for, for COVID-19. Um, Portland has a case rate of 12.3 per 100,000. And if we see what's been happening around the state and locally, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that number ticks up and if Portland and other towns in the district end up on the red alert level just like East Hampton. But it's not a foregone conclusion. For example, Colchester, which has been in the orange alert level for the longest, running on four weeks at this point, um, they've sort of moved up and down within that orange alert level. Um, so they've not seen further acceleration of the outbreak in Colchester, and I hope that, not that I hope we stay at Orange, but I hope that we can see the same thing occur in, in the rest of our towns, that we sort of flatten the curve, to borrow a term from March and April, and keep things at a manageable level and maybe even see some decline. That's my hope. Right, right. Well, I know you've been in close contact, and not only with Charles, but with all the superintendents around, uh, as far as that goes. So, uh you know, I think from from that standpoint, I, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I think everybody is is has to be aware of now with the upcoming uh, Thanksgiving Day holiday and so forth. So we has to, we have to be uh, extra vigilant, you know, as far as that goes. Yeah, we're we're sort of at the tip of the iceberg of the holiday season, and and I'll include Halloween in there, and I'll I'll tell you why in a minute. But yeah, we're at the tip of the iceberg where people are going to start getting together or thinking about getting together with friends and family to celebrate holidays. Um, and we've already had a little taste of what that might be like with Halloween. 
And I know uh, you know many people didn't participate in sort of the, the traditional trick or treating or trunk or treat events. There was a lot of different approaches to that. Some people did, and that that's okay. The one thing that we did see a little bit of were Halloween parties, yep. and we saw those parties, those get-togethers happen. In some cases, it was families. In other cases, it was you know circles of friends. And in some cases, specifically, we uh, got reports of some you know older high school students having Halloween parties in in, in home. And we even had people, you know, fairly credibly send us uh, pictures and videos of, of of parties. You couldn't make out sort of faces or names of people, so I don't want people to think that there's uh, there's a way to figure out who was there and who wasn't. Really, it's a very blurry blurry video. But you know, we did send out and we we sent out some draft language to all our superintendents to to let their families know that there might have been some parties going on around Halloween, and to encourage people if they attended those parties to get tested. Because those kinds of gatherings are the highest risk for transmission of COVID-19. You know, indoors, no masks, um, dancing, music, socializing, things like that in, in very small spaces. And we actually did see some cases as a result. So we, we sent some, some of our school districts sent out that notification. Some parents had that conversation with their with their teens, got them tested, and we did actually see some cases and did need to do some quarantines in some of our school districts as a result. So for those of you who think it's some abstract concept that, you know, it's not going to happen to me, we can get together with people that we know and love and trust, it's quite the opposite. You are far, far, far more likely to get COVID-19 from somebody you know than from somebody you don't know. Right. So for those of you who are sort of worried about going to the grocery store or sitting at a table outdoors with your family at a restaurant or... Um, or anything like that, going for a walk around your neighborhood, you are far more likely to have friends or family over to your home for a couple hours and get COVID from them than you are from any of those other circumstances. So as we move into the holiday season, please keep your gatherings brief. Keep them small. Keep them outdoors if you can. Keep them masked. Um, you know, The state has put in a recommendation or a rule, so to speak, of, of social gathering size limits. And at a private residence, that limit right now is 10. So you know, don't have more than 10 people at your home at any one time, at least. And I would recommend sticking closer to just your immediate family. Sure. Yeah, I think that's the, the wisest thing to do. You know, And I know with uh, uh, Charles is here, and, and uh, I know they had a, uh, a Board of Education meeting Tuesday night, and I know you guys talk very frequently. So, Charles, why don't you give us an idea of what's happening uh, in, in our Portland School District and uh, – Russ can chime in, and uh, some of the, uh, I'm sure the, the, the phone calls are, are, are frequent between you and him. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. they go from there. Yeah. And, Russ has uh, been amazing, by the way. He's been absolutely outstanding through this whole thing. And it, yeah, he's on my cell phone. As soon as I call him, within 10 minutes, he's back to me. It's, it's outstanding. And just to be clear, the, the Halloween party was not in Portland. So, that's a good um, thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and that's really... I'm being careful not to mention any specific districts, <laughs> just saying we heard it happen yeah. <laughs> somewhere. And, and what I want to say with that, and I think Russ w would agree, is that I'll, I'll remind everybody, our ability to keep the schools open is going to be a reflection of decisions that families and students and, and people in our community make. Right. And, and to, to Russ's point, if, if people continue to make the right choices... I get to keep schools open, and really, that's all I want. Right? And does that, does that mean you sacrifice that big Thanksgiving traditional dinner that you look forward to every year? It, it does, and, and and I'll be more direct than than Russ. Do it. Sure. You'll get back to it next year, and everybody will have a seat at that table. You won't have any empty chairs, right? You got to make those sacrifices now. If you don't, I'm I'm going to be in a, a real jam, and you're you know I, I don't want to go there. So, right. It's time to double down both on the mitigation strategies and giving up, especially during Christmas and Thanksgiving, those things we all look forward to, which is time with family and friends. And I'm really sorry about that. Zoom is a wonderful alternative, but that's what we have to do now. Right, right. Now, I know, um, you know, we went back uh, full on uh, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Yeah. So, so tell us the status of the district now, uh, um, yep. Charles. So um, up to last Friday, we were rolling. Um, we didn't have any cases enter our schools, um, even though the numbers had, had gone up in town. We, we were doing really well. Uh, lots of our, our uh, 
students, faculty, and staff were quarantined and I'm aware of some that had tested positive. But all of those um, positive results were from community events, not in school. Mm -hmm. Nobody can, and because people made the right choice and when they weren't feeling well, stayed home, nobody was in school during a time when contact tracing would otherwise have said, hey, they were infectious during a time when they were in school. People had been making good decisions and um, doing the right things. That changed this past Sunday. So Sunday afternoon, around 1 o'clock, um, a parent notified one of our uh, nurses that uh, their child tested positive uh, for um, an exposure, in, again, in the community. Um, contact tracing was done, and we made the decision that Three members of our faculty and staff and a class of kindergarten students are home uh, for now 10 more days uh, quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, Tuesday afternoon, we had a report that a member of our faculty was positive at Brownstone. Again, same process. We called Russ. Our contact tracers did all the work necessary. Um, and the entire sixth grade is now home remote learning. Now, I want to be clear about one thing, that the sixth grade is not home because of a mass outbreak in sixth grade or, or contact tracers said the entire sixth grade was exposed. The sixth grade is home because the number of teachers who are forced to quarantine limited our ability to staff the building. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, adults have to show up to work, and, and if enough adults are unable to do that because they're subject to the quarantine, that's when we have to go uh, to the remote. Remote, model. sure. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are as of today. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and of course, I'm hopeful that, that that's these are the only ones. Uh, but we're learning a lot from this. Our, uh, Russ has done um, an incredible job training our nurses on how to do the contact tracing. Mm -hmm. um, so we are prepared um, to do the contact tracing and then adjust where necessary in terms of individual quarantine, class level quarantine, grade level quarantine, and if necessary, potentially building level quarantine. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, now, now Russ, I know you went over the, the contact tracing process, so maybe you, we can just kind of go over that real quickly again uh, for our listeners out there. Sure. And, you know, when, you know, obviously Charles notifies you and uh, you go through the process, so uh, take us through that process. Sure, so, um, you know, the way it's, you know, there, there's two sort of ways we find out about cases, and one is through our traditional public health surveillance systems where laboratories send positive test results to the local health departments through an electronic reporting system. It gets flagged. We have a, you know, a nurse that, that picks it up, and it goes into our contact tracing system, and that takes a couple of days. The other way is from, you know, conscientious parents, um, just talking about schools in this case, who get the positive test result from the laboratory or the testing center or their physician, and, and they call Charles right away, <laughs> or the, the principal or whoever, and they say, <clears throat> uh, Charles, you know, Russ tested positive, just want to let you know he was in school. Um, and then, you know, Charles calls, calls me, and we initiate contact tracing. And that's a much faster way to get things done. There's no delay from the reporting systems. It's just a much better way to get this done. So that's how it's really been working lately. Um, almost exclusively, we're getting parents calling the schools, doing what they should do, saying that they've got a positive test result. We coordinate. Charles has a good team in place. You know, we get on either a Google Meet or a Zoom or a phone call, and we talk about the objectives, and the objectives are quite simple, um, though the process is not. The objective is to identify anybody who is in close contact with that person when they were infectious, um, and that is within six feet for 15 minutes or more over a 24-hour period, and the infectious period starts about 48 hours before the person became symptomatic. So, so we're looking for people who spent 15 minutes within six feet of that person, and that could have happened before they were symptomatic. So the first thing we do is we try to figure out when the symptoms started for this person. And, and that's part of just an interview process with the actual individual who's sick. <clears throat> and once we sort of nail down that day and that day and time, then we put the brackets around it. We go 48 hours before, and we go move forward to the last day that person was in school. And that's the, that's the, the time frame that we're looking at. Sometimes it's, it's zero days because the person knew they were a close contact of, say, a sibling or a parent in, in the home, and they were quarantined when they got sick. 
That actually happens probably around two to one when it comes to schools. See, it's about twice as many cases where the student becomes sick at home and they were quarantining because they know they had contact with somebody in the home and there were no school contacts. But, you know, every once in a while, about one-third of the cases, they, they were in school during their infectious period because they weren't aware of any close contact they had. Right, right. So then we just start, you know, we, we look at class schedules. Uh, Charles' staff look, uh, look at class schedules. They look at seating charts. We uh, interview the teachers and ask about, you know, were there any breakdowns in the seating charts? Did the students move around or did they stay in their chairs? Was it loud? Were people wearing masks? We really try to do a thorough assessment of, where this person was at any given time, what they were doing, who they were near, and once we get those lists together, um, we let everybody know. You know, you were in close contact with a with a person who's confirmed to have COVID-19 and you need to quarantine, and this is what that involves. Sure. Um, it can be done very quickly. In some cases, just a matter of hours, and in other cases, um, if it's a complicated situation, it might take a day. <clears throat> um, but but we make sure we do a thorough job, and Charles' staff has been excellent. They're getting very good at it, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we make sure we're conservative. You know, that means we if there's any uncertainty about close contact, we assume there was close contact. Sure. Not the other way around. Right. You err on the side of caution. Err right. on the side of caution. So if somebody says, yeah, it was within six feet, but I don't know if it was 15 minutes. It could have been 12 or 10. If we don't know for sure, we err on the side of caution. And that same goes for six feet. So... If you measure chair to chair, if Charles and I are in the same class together and I get sick and, and, you know, somebody goes in with a tape measure and measures my chair to Charles's chair to see if Charles was within six feet, and it's six feet, six inches, <clears throat> you know, back of the chair to the back of the chair. <clears throat> well, we say, well, people shift a lot, shift around in their chair, right? Who sits still in their chair perfectly mm -hmm. with their back up against the back of the chair? Nobody. <laughs> so right. if, if we find that it's six feet, six inches from chair to chair, we assume that's close contact. Um, if it's, you know, seven and a half feet, eight feet, well, then we don't assume close contact. Right, right. Um, so that's kind of how it goes. And then people are told to quarantine for 14 days from that day that they were last in contact with the person who's sick. Sure, sure. Now, Charles, how many times a week do you, you uh, have of uh, Russ on speed dial here? Yeah, well, we're, we're talking pretty, pretty regularly at this point. So I, I just want to you know, talk about a couple of things to that. And I'm sure Russ will, will agree, and he and I are on the same page with this. So those numbers that, that Russ started with, the orange, the red, um, those numbers were set in August by the Department of Public Health mm -hmm. before schools were open, right? They, they, I don't want to say that somebody threw a, a, a dart at a dartboard. I, I think there was a lot more thought about that, but they, they were set at a time when, when – we didn't have any experience with whether schools would be super spreaders, whether you know it would be uh, a, a bad event when somebody positive came into school and how far it would spread. So those numbers are, are important as a place for us to stop and reflect. Um, but they're not red lines anymore. They're, they're not, okay, you're above 10, you must go to hybrid. They're above 25, you must go to remote. You know, they're... 24.5, so you can go back to hybrid. Mm -hmm. What's important is once we reach those numbers, and now we have, we're, we're orange, for us to ask ourselves the, the questions. Right? Question one, has COVID spread in your school? Right? Um, and at this point, and Russ can correct me if I'm wrong, I think the answer to that is we are not aware of COVID spreading from student to student or student to teacher in our schools. And we're now in a really interesting place because we know we've had positive people in our schools and that the contact tracers have told about contacts happening in schools. But so far, the tests that have come back from those people that interacted with the positive people in schools have been negative. That's a good thing. Uh, that's an amazing thing. Yes. Like, like, that's the greatest news of all of this. Mm -hmm. Because if COVID causes mass outbreaks in our schools, we're shutting. Yeah. Or we're going back to hybrid. Sure. So, and, and Russ, maybe if you wanted to comment on that from a more statewide perspective, it, 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 is that accurate? <clears throat> yes, that's correct. So, you know, I think the state last week anyway reported that across schools, since the beginning of schools, there's been somewhere in the area of 500 cases in students or staff 
across the state. And there's been extremely limited examples of where there's been actual transmission as a result. And when there's been transmission in schools, it's been one case, gives it to one, maybe two other people. Um, and most of the time, there's no transmission. I'm not saying that transmission of any kind is, is good or okay or, uh, you know, that, that we want to see that. We don't. But during a pandemic, um, when we see community transmission accelerating and we don't really see much of it going on in schools, it seems to us that schools may be among the safer places for people to be at this point. So when we don't see a lot of transmission in schools, you know, it tells us that all the mitigation strategies that are being done in schools from cleaning and disinfecting schedules to mask wearing compliance to increased ventilation air exchange rates using the HVAC systems to the sick person protocols, you know, if you're sick, you stay away and people are keeping their kids out to compliance with quarantine. If you know you've been in close contact, you stay out of school. You know, what we know is that those things are all seem to be working very, very well. Mm -hmm. So um, just to echo what Charles was saying, yes, I mean, it, it seems to us that we haven't seen much um, transmission, certainly no outbreaks or sustained transmission in schools where, you know, one person comes in and, you know, 12 other classmates get it and then they give it to somebody else and there's not only secondary but tertiary transmission. So that would be right. a sick person comes in and gives it to somebody else and before you can finish contact tracing, that second person is giving it to a third person. So sustained chains of transmission we have not seen. And so that's all great news. Um, and in Portland, you know, I think with these couple of cases, it's it's uh, time to reflect on what happened when we had these cases. How did contact tracing go? Right. What did we find out when we asked teachers and students about mask wearing compliance, about social distancing? Did cohorting break down or was it successfully adhered to? I mean, all those things are questions that at this point have been unanswered in Portland, but elsewhere in the state um, seem to have gone well. Sure. Well, I think it's, you know, it's just up to everybody to do their due diligence. Uh, from Dave, I would just add to that. I'll, literally, I'll know more by the end of the day tomorrow. Sure. Right? So, but right now, let's hope our experience mirrors what Russ is seeing with those other 500 cases in the state. Sure. And, and if that's the case, if, if we know we had a positive person in school, we know that person was in, in the six feet range or or in the building with other people, but our other mitigation strategies held, the mask wearing, the sure. hand washing, um, then, then hey, that, that tells me a lot. It gives me a great deal of confidence about our ability to keep the schools open. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, the, the second question, this, is, this one answers itself. If COVID is causing large numbers of our faculty and staff to have to stay home, well, that's going to make Impact. us go to remote or, or hybrid, clearly. I mean, if I can't open schools if I don't have the adults here to teach and supervise. Correct. And, and then, there, of course, if, if it is true that COVID's not spreading in school, and if it is true that mass quarantines have not affected our ability to keep schools open because we don't have the adults, hey, we're going to keep schools open. But then there's the third question, right, which is how effective are your mitigation strategies? Are you cohorting? Are you social distancing? Are you sanitizing? Are you keeping the masks on? Right now, I, I would say up to this point, I give us an A. I would say this week, I give us an A minus. Okay. Okay. And I better not get us below a B plus. There you go. And that's not a warning. That, that's a, a, a reminder. Particularly, I'm going to call out to our, some of our middle school students. Mm -hmm. who I have observed, and I'm hearing reports from some of our teachers, that there, there's a little pandemic fatigue setting in, particularly during our mask breaks. Some, when the masks are off, there's some closer congregating. We are, we are going to tighten up, and I'm not going to have it. Sure. And so any, any students that are hearing my voice now, I would say follow the rules, or you're going to um, find the sharp side of my tongue. There you go. And, and going forward, um, and, and just give our listeners a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a purview of, of, you know, the mass breaks and, and how you're structuring, you know, the, uh, you know, the full on learning in, in the school. Yeah. So um, the mask breaks are really important and, and, and we've been blessed with good weather. So now the masks are able to come off when kids are outside and, and we are allowing students to take advantage of that mask break. In some cases, take a nice walk around the track or around the building. Um, and we want to continue to be able to do that. 
but it's particularly important when the masks are off, even if you're outside enjoying the nice weather, that you're not, you know, yelling in each other's faces or singing songs together or, or talking closely or, or, you know, that, that distance and that lower tone of voice is even more important, even if you're outside. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I get it, it's hard. You know, ki kids want to be kids. They want to play. They want to sing. They want to sure. you know, do the TikTok dances or whatever they do, right? <laughs> But, but that, that's where it's starting to break down a little bit at times. Um, I've, I've had some um, difficult conversations with some students, and, and I know our principals are. But we, we, if we're going to continue to have mask breaks that way, students are going to follow the rules or we're not going to have it. Sure. You know, and you know, speaking of you know, singing and so forth, I, I have to uh, uh, give a, a shout-out to your music department. We had our... Uh, Veterans Day ceremony, which was kind of a hybrid ceremony uh, by the town hall yesterday. And obviously, normally the students participate as far as playing the Star Spangled Banner. But I know Sam Tucker uh, and uh, Kristen Novak and also uh, Sarah Ketterer uh, put together a, a virtual rendition of the Star Spangled Banner uh, and the Armed Forces marches that uh, we we played, uh, you know, during the ceremony. So uh, kudos to them. And, you know, when we they did the Zoom meeting and they were all socially distanced and singing in the auditorium, so that was it was pretty cool. So shout out to them and great job. So, but uh, but that's that's great. Now you know from from a standpoint of uh, you know precautionary measures, I know you had an incident this week. Now typically, what what's the protocol, um, uh, Philip? Uh, Philip, um, here right, we go, Charles. Uh, as far as in relation to if you do have, do you have to bring those? Are those decisions? Uh, basically your purview i know you bring it to the board but is, does the board make a, a final decision on that how does that work i, I in terms of who, who quarantines or, or the, yeah if you're going to be shutting off or you know yeah so so i i make those decisions okay um, the board board's empowered me um to 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 make make the calls mm -hmm. I, I don't make them in isolation of course I, I make them in consultation with the building principals the teachers and ross um uh, but, but the board doesn't make those decisions right. specifically so I know, uh, and again, the, the, the board has been, I'm in a phenomenally uh, supportive uh, as far as in relation to that, and uh, it, w which is great. Uh, we can go from there. But um, that's. Well, well, one other thing before we jump off, and, and while we got Russ on the line here, I, I want to talk a little bit about some, some recent guidelines that Russ shared with me and were reported pretty widely in the, the uh, media about winter sports. And I know how important that is to a lot mm -hmm. of our students. Um, and again, I'll, I'll give you my impression of it, and, and Russ can, can fill in some of the, the, the details about what makes a, a, a sport high risk or not. So the difference between fall and winter sports is that winter sports, of course, move inside. Right? That, that makes them more dangerous in general in a, in a pandemic. So the guidelines classified sports as high risk, medium risk, and low risk. We have two winter sports in Portland that are high risk. Those sports are wrestling and cheerleading. Um, Russ can certainly talk about what makes those um, particularly high risk. I, I think you know, anybody who's aware of how those sports are played, it would be logical to assume that spit droplets would spread when you're wrestling or, or cheering loudly and doing lifts and all of those things in, in cheerleading. Moderate risk sports that we have here include indoor track and basketball. So the guidance is to not have high-risk sports this winter. And I know that that is very disappointing to hear for our wrestlers and cheerleaders. The recommendation is that you could have um, basketball and indoor track, except only if during those highly aerobic activities, masks are worn. Um, I am still seeking clarification and guidance from medical professionals about how safe it is to wear masks during highly aerobic activities like basketball. Um, once we receive that guidance, uh, we'll make a decision about whether it's safe to allow. And of course, our athletes will have to make a decision about if they choose to play basketball, their ability and willingness to wear masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Russ, do you want to jump in on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the I think Charles kind of described the issue of high risk sports appropriately and that is nobody you know not not you know the US Olympic team you know team USA not you know uh, any any governing body of any of these sports is recommending indoor high risk sports 
competitions occur at this point. Right. And so I think that the, the latest guidance from DPH reflects that. And there are some things you can do to mitigate risk so that you can engage in things like small group conditioning and non-contact drills for those high-risk sports. Um, but whenever it comes to you know team practices or intra-squad scrimmages or actual competitions between two teams, uh, those essentially have been ruled out by DPH uh, mm-hmm. as, as too high risk. Sure. There's no way to do the kinds of things that you see in competitive dance and cheer and, and wrestling um, with masks on and social distancing. It's just not successfully, it can't be successfully done from anybody's perspective. And that's kind of, you know, the, the, the guidance places these, these categories on certain sports and then bases recommendations around the different types of activities that occur with those sports from, like I said, conditioning to team practices to in-state competitions to multi-state competitions, things like that, Um, and says if you can put in certain mitigation strategies while doing those certain activities that depending on whether they're high risk or moderate risk, they may be allowed. But there are some things that really just you can't imagine being able to do those competitions especially successfully while wearing masks for example and social distancing right right well again uh, everybody has to do the the due diligence and you know uh do their part you know from that standpoint and uh, i'm sure uh given last week's at weekend's football game you had to be cringing during at, at the end of that notre dame game when oh they that was oh my god I, I think everybody was cringing on that one yeah uh, so, and i think you know the the you know, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone, but I'm sure there are people who have different opinions than, than mine and, and perhaps others. But if we think about what our objective is with schools right now during the pandemic, what is our goal? And within that goal, what's our, what are our objectives? If our goal is to keep schools open um, for as long as possible, then one of those objectives has to be to limit close contacts, mm-hmm. so there's n- limiting quarantine, limiting the number of cases we see in schools. And among the things that are going to get us there, you know, is limiting the types of interactions that that students have outside of the learning environment. Sure. And, and that, that's sports and that's other things, other, other clubs that students have, you know, I'm sure there are people who really love, you know, the photography club and love getting into the dark room and doing things like that. Well, you know, that could be considered moderate risk as well. I mean, there's a whole host of things that are not central to core education of our mm-hmm. students that we might just have to do without for the time being and, and that includes some of those high risk sports sure yeah and, and i i think russ said that that perfectly and, and with that I, I just have to say i understand how disappointing that is for our students who are passionate about those things and, and i get it and i thank you for your sacrifice and this isn't forever but it's what we have to do right now sure absolutely I do want to say one more thing about sports, and this is sort of maybe um, sort of speaking about sports and their, the role they play in school and in college and in society perhaps more broadly, and to echo something and to build on what Charles just said, and that is that sports play a very vital role in, in, in education, not necessarily in some of the things that people might think of as education, but in educating people about um, you know, teamwork and hard work and discipline and, and things like that. It's very important, and it also plays a fairly central role for some of our students in their ability to seek higher education through scholarships and things like that. And that, that does have an impact on public health writ large, you know, in society, generational public health, you know, getting a higher education. So I, I don't think it's an easy decision to say we're not going to do, you know, football. Um, we're not going to do wrestling because there are students who rely on, for example, scholarships to go to college. Yeah. And I, I understand that this is, for some, a much larger sacrifice than it is for others, and it is unfortunate. Sure. You know, uh, speaking of colleges, Russ, I mean, uh, I know a lot of the colleges, uh, and maybe you have a better insight than I do, but uh, a lot of the colleges throughout the state, um, as far as in relation to uh, uh, students are, are you know, going home for uh, Thanksgiving, and they're not coming back until this the spring semester. Is that kind of your read on a lot of the colleges? It seems like that's happening quite a bit. Those decisions have been made in a lot of cases and are being made at this point. <clears throat> so a lot of colleges are sort of closing before Thanksgiving and not reopening until after the New Year mm-hmm. um, or later, depending on how 
COVID goes. And, sure. you know, what we know about colleges at this point is that especially for students who live on campus, it is um, a fairly high-risk environment. You are having young adults, you know, live together in dormitories especially where they're sharing bathrooms and sharing rooms together. Um, even with the testing infrastructure that has been implemented in most colleges where in some cases they're testing every student every week. In other cases they're testing students who live in on-campus dormitories. You know, 25% of every dorm is tested every week, things like that, mm -hmm. to do some outbreak detection. They've had outbreaks. You know, they've had large widespread quarantines. Um, sure. It's been very difficult. And, and I think we all know, for those of us who have been young adults at one point, the types of attitudes and behaviors that go along with those attitudes that young adults engage in. And sure. They're high risk. You know, they're young, they're healthy, um, they're at the sort of the peak of their lives, enjoying time away from, from their parents um, for maybe the first time. And they're doing things like going to parties. And, and you know, it just it is what it is as much as we would like to discourage it. So, you know, when those colleges close for a couple of months and those students come home, for any of you who are listening who are having a college-age student come home for the holidays, um, for the first couple of weeks after they return, have them wear a mask inside. I know it seems silly. Um, I know it's difficult. You want to hug them. You want to sit with them on a couch. You want to share meals with them. And, of course, you do want to do those things. But do them as safely as possible. You know, um, wear a mask for a couple of weeks. Stay home, you know, out of everybody's way for a couple of weeks just to see. Give it some time to see if any possible exposures result in illness. Sure. Because we don't want to see clusters and outbreaks in homes and then have those people go to work and to school um, and see our community transmission rates accelerate as a result. Great. Well, I appreciate that, Russ. And uh, again, Dr. Charles Britton and uh, uh, Mr. Russ Melman, who is the Director of uh, Health for the Chatham Health District. And uh, thanks for coming on. I know Susan wasn't available today to do uh, our normal Town of Portland podcast, but we're kind of uh, uh, cohorting our school district podcast and our town podcast. And uh, uh, I appreciate you guys coming on. And Charles... Uh, you know, uh, all of your hard work and all of your staff, um, you know, doing all of the due diligence. We certainly appreciate uh, everything that you do. And uh, we look forward to uh, hopefully next week we'll have some more good news and uh, we'll go from there. But uh, uh, so on behalf of us here at the town of Portland and the Portland School District, I'm your host, Dave Kuzminski. And again, I'd like to thank uh, our host today, uh, Dr. Charles Britton, uh, our uh, superintendent of schools, and uh, Russ Melmet, who is our director of health for the Chatham Health District. So, um, as I always say, stay home, stay safe, wash your hands, and, uh, you know, do your cohorting. So, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Dave Kosminski. Please tune in every week for new and relevant conversations about the town of Portland. You can find us at portlandct.org or at YouTube forward slash Town of Portland. And now, wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please consider subscribing and sharing with friends. This podcast was produced by the Town Tech Educational Partnership Program, which is a partnership between Portland High School and the Portland Town Hall. If you're looking to start a podcast for your business or organization, check out towntech.org forward slash podcast to learn more.